Mishmash! Hey, uh, today we're doing part two of the Quartractor Tractor series. And today we're going to be taking a look at the Crusade's signature light armored tractor, the Althean. In this video, you can expect a good portion of lore, we'll go into the tidbits and anecdotes of the actual tractor, and we'll do some painting. I can teach you some cool tips and tricks on how to weather the vehicle, and we can go over some of the official schemes. Like I stated in the previous episode, I plan on going over just about every tractor that Core has to offer, so you can expect some future videos. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe, share it with a friend, and if you really dig it, consider becoming a channel member. For just 3 bucks a month, you can see my videos early, and for 5 you get access to a weekly Q&A, as well as a Your Dude section within the Q&A. You can send in your figures, and I'll yap about them. Additionally, if you're a channel member and you join the Mishmash Discord, you'll get an exclusive role and you'll get to see some cool sneak peeks. Just want to give a huge thank you to my channel members. You guys are amazing. And if you want to get your greebly mitts on some cool core models, you can use my affiliate link down below to Wargames Atlantic. It doesn't cost you anything and it really helps me out. And for the Althean itself, you can get it at zombiesmith.com as well as the STL form on myminifactory.com under Josh Qualtieri's store. But hey, enough of the promotional stuff, get tucked in, have a moth cake, and let's talk about the Althean. Originally developed in 1750, the Althean light armored tractor was built to replace the ubiquitous and unpopular Mogwin light tractor. At this time, light armor tractors were increasingly used for scouting and pursuit operations along the Tauk creased border. Speed and cross-country ability quickly became a must for the Tauk-ish tractor corps. The Althean was designed from the treads up rather than a reworking of the basic Mogwin, as it had been done in the previous decades. By comparison, she has thicker armor, an enclosed hull, and twice the Kadir power and a much improved suspension system. The fighting compartment is extremely cramped and loud, however. Often during cross-country travel, the commander and gunner will ride outside on top of the hull, while the driver is typically left inside to sweat and bang his elbows. Good thing they have pads for him. Primarily, the Althean is deployed as a rifler support tractor. Althean squadrons are often attached to rifler brigades in the field. Altheans primarily serve as armored scouts and screens for advancing riflers, as well as adding firepower to the infantry line on the attack. The 78mm gun utilizes high explosive rounds and the tractor may also carry canister and smoke rounds in limited quantity. However, the main gun also functions as a passable anti-tractor gun when required against lightly armored tractors, this primarily being the Chiwethel, the main tractor of their nemesis nation of Koftir. But like most talk design tractors, the Althean sacrifices speed for heavier armor and a combined hull and turret. Compared to most tractors within Quar, this thing is actually really sophisticated. Most tractors in Quar typically have a stationary gun and rely on moving the treads to actually aim it. However, this brings me to the greatest drawback of the Althean. While the Althean does have several advantages over more of the outdated tractors in Allwid, the sheer weight of the Althean requires the tractor's transmission to be used for the turret. This means they have to disengage the drive wheels for the tracks while the hull slash turret is brought to bear on its target. Yeah, the fact that it can't do these two things in conjunction really does bring this thing down a peg. While in an active skirmish, it's not exactly ideal to be a sitting duck while aiming my gun. Especially when you're a high priority target that's boasting both firepower and cover for oncoming riflers. But that extra armor does provide quite a buffer, so this thing is still pretty damn good. Now to get back into the more historical elements of the Althean, the tractor, like I stated previously, was first deployed in 1750. During Elekinder's reformation of the Takish military structure in 1748, during the campaign into Lake Mirandi, the tractor corps of Tak had convincingly demonstrated that it was not yet ready to fight with the fluidity that Elekinder required. Once the Aeromobile Corp of the Crusade was cemented, the tractor corps was next to receive his attention. And that was exactly what brought the Althean to life. Currently, there are three Takish and a brand new Eski based factory producing Altheans. Production varies quite a bit, although the light tractors suffer many fewer maintenance problems than their heavy brethren. 
To add on to the pros of the Altheon, it's a very reliable vehicle. Though that's not really surprising, I don't think Alakinder would have it any other way. In fact, this thing is so reliable and beloved that many city-states under Crusader control have purchased Altheons in 1s and 2s to shore up their own defenses. Or they've scavenged them from the battlefield and restored them. There's actually been several reports of Crevish partisans fielding them within Lower Creven, and that's not really surprising. Ever since their inception 150 years ago, White Tractor Squadrons have been organized along the same lines as the cavalry, and carry on several of their traditions. Altheans are arranged in wedges of six tractors with three wedges forming a troop. Three troops form a squadron. Currently, there are 147 Altheon equipped squadrons. 14 of these are attached to guard units, and the remaining squadrons are deployed along the many fronts of the Crusade. Due to their ineffectiveness against the Fedwag Highlands and their heavy losses at the hands of the Imli Kilch, there are only a handful of Altheans actually deployed along the Fedwag front. But above everything else, the Altheon is a hell of a tractor. Despite its drawbacks, it's undoubtedly a very modernized piece of equipment compared to the rest of the tractors in all Volwood. And that's saying something, because there are some wacky-ass designs within the Crusade. But like most of the vehicles within Quar and their parent factions, I can't help but feel the Alfian really does embody the spirit of the Crusade. It's a good soldier, it knows what it has to do, it knows its role in the battlefield, and when used correctly, it is a hell of a tool of war. And to kind of wrap up the lore portion of the Alfian, I want to go over my favorite little anecdote. See, while trying to make their way to a rendezvous point, a tractor crew had crashed and wedged their Altheon onto a tree stump. Oh, shanty bollocks, I've done it now. With no hope of recovery, or for a vehicle to pull them free, the Iskeriton of the trio Mello had set up on the rear deck of the tractor, taking in the warm springtime breeze and radiant sun. He'd fill his tin cup from his mess kit with some water from the canteen, and he'd carefully place it on the engine compartment. All while his Yadril kept gunning the engine, hoping to rock the beast free from that damn stump. He'd keep it to himself, but Milo knew damn well they weren't going anywhere unless a Baleog showed up. And he was more than content with the delay, even if he got a snoutful for it. The war front had taken its toll, and he couldn't remember the last time he had a nice hot cup of tea. And he planned to enjoy it. Give it another go, Core. The water's almost ready. He'd call down from the hatch compartment. I love these little bastards. But I think that does it for the lore portion. I've given you a little background on the tractor itself, and I've given you some anecdotes, so I think it's about time we do a little painting. Now for the actual model, I ended up printing this off using the STL form on Josh Qualtieri's store on MyManyFactory.com. If you want to order a physical release, you can get it at Zombiesmith.com, like I stated previously. Now when it comes to priming the vehicle, I usually end up using Vallejo's German Panzer Grey Primer. And for the Xenophil Prime when using warmer colors, I end up using Procryl's Khaki mixed with Dark Ivory. And for cooler colors, I typically just use some Bold Titanium White. But as you can see for the model we're painting today, I'm going with the warmer colors. You'll also probably notice I'm going with kind of a streaky, over-the-top, and downright messy way of applying these base colors. I'm aware that for a good chunk of my audience, Quar is their first war game, and thus a lot of newer painters are flocking to the channel. So here, I'm going to show you how to get the most out of undercoating your tractor. Though this method seems over the top, I guarantee you it'll look really good in the end. The scratches we're making with the khaki will provide for a much more subtle color beneath the bolder colors we'll apply shortly after. As you can see, I'm really taking my time to entirely coat the overall model with this color, getting it to a point where we have a setup area for all the places the light will catch. I find the makeup brush to be the best for this method, as we can utilize it for more dexterous sweepy strokes while also creating very sporadic stabs and random undercoating chips. And as you can see, we're taking that to an extreme once we use our brighter color, this being the dark ivory. I'm really stabbing this in, and as I stab it in, I can drag the brush downward to create these strokes, and I can create these really naturally scratchy and roughed up surfaces for the undercoating of the paint. I will say, it is really easy to get carried away with this, and I definitely did as you can see on the front portion of the Altheon, but you can definitely work that into the scheme. We can easily cover this up using a little bit of weathering, and it'll be really fun to play around as the sporadic nature really plays into the your dudes element of the game. And lastly, for the final portion of the undercoating, I am dry brushing on the edges using just a little bit of bold titanium white. You can probably guess by this point, this just ensures that the sharpest points will be the brightest on the model. 
But once you're happy with your undercoat, we'll now apply a mixture of 50-50 camo cloak and desolate brown from Army Painter Speed Paints. I'm applying this with an airbrush because it's just much more efficient. But if I really wanted to, I could apply this using a regular brush. Though I am using a darker color, you can already see just how much this undercoat really affects the overall finish to the model. I know it's the whole point of the whole contrast thing, though I'm using speed paints, not contrast. But because of what we did, we created some really interesting contrast on the model. And as you can see, once it's dried, this looks really interesting. You can add on to it, but if you really want to, you could just put this as a tabletop standard. Use the same undercoating method, but use different colors. But I do want to take this just a little step further, so I'm going to be dry brushing over this color using a little bit of olive green from Army Painter Fanatics. We really don't have to do much beyond this, well, except for the weathering that I want to apply. But this is a really simplistic method just to bring everything together. It just adds a little bit more flair and makes it stand out just a little bit more on the tabletop. And especially on vehicles, this is really fun to do. Now that our armor is basically complete, I'm going to show you the fun little extra mile we can take to really make this thing stand out. Firstly, I'm going to show you how I freehand the squirrel emblem from the Crusade. To get us started, I want to pick out a flat panel of the Althean itself, and we'll begin sketching on the head of the squirrel. As you can see, the color I'm using is very similar to the colors that we used on the undercoat. The reason I'm doing this is if we mess up, we can just use some contrast colors over it and fix it. I'm not the best at freehand, especially catching it on camera, so this is especially helpful for me. And when you're doing this, make sure to have a really good tip on your brush, and don't be afraid to move the model around to help you out when drawing this on. Now for the legs and wings, we can really slowly start drawing this on and sketching it out so the head is in the middle. You can already tell this is a little lopsided, but that's okay. We can clean this up. We just want to make sure the arc between the lower arms and the bottom legs are different in size. The arms being a much shorter arc, while the legs being a much longer arc. Again, don't be afraid to sketch this out, and if you really need to, you can use a mechanical pencil to sketch out the design. I probably should have done that myself. And once you've sketched out a little bowling pin shape for the tail, you can begin filling in the portion of your design using the same color. Again, it's okay if it's not perfect. Plus, if you want to, you could actually leave portions of the design not entirely filled in so you can create more contrast like we did with the first method. But before I apply the yellow color to finish off the emblem, I'm taking our previous mixture on the main armor and just sketching around the design and we're just cleaning things up around the edges. Just to make sure that this thing looks a little bit more symmetrical and it just looks a little bit better on the model overall. Once this dries, it'll look a lot better. It definitely looks ugly when you're first applying it but it's just a simple method of trusting the process. But once I'm done cleaning up the design just a little bit, I'll then be applying some Imperial Fist Yellow over the design. And yeah, it's not perfect. There's definitely some little areas that could be fixed, but that's what we'll do with the next method that I'm going to be showing you. And hey, might not be perfect, but I think it looks pretty damn serviceable, especially for a tabletop standard. I'm going for a tabletop standard if you can't tell. Now to create a little bit of wear and tear on the model, I'm going to be applying a mixture of black mixed with some Parasite Brown and a little bit of regular Warm Brown as we dance around the model and essentially shade this in. If you saw my previous episode, essentially what this method is, is creating your own version of Rust Streaks with a lot more control. Using this method, you can shade in certain portions and drag down the brush to create natural streaks and you can limit just how much orange there is to brown. Some areas might be grimy, some areas might be entirely rusty. Now if you want to use streaking grime, I totally get you. But with this method, it allows you a lot more freedom and not having to use any spirits to wipe away the excess. With this, you can paint it on and just wick it away with your finger as you see fit. And especially with the base color that we chose, this orange really contrasts nice with the green. I will say, however, try not to go too overboard with this. Creating a little bit in some areas will create a much more effective method of making this look realistic. Now another pro I do want to mention is the consistency between Parasite Brown and our other colors that we're using, is Parasite Brown dries a little bit more quickly, and thus it creates a much more speckled look to the overall model, giving it a much more interesting rust tone. Once you're happy with your rust streaks, you can then dry brush over the entirety of the model using a little bit of Vallejo Metallic Silver. This gives a much more industrial feeling to the overall design, kind of the gusto of pig iron and steel. But if you don't want to do that, you're fine. 
This is definitely within my personal taste. I just think it looks cool. That is one little final method. I'm gonna be filling in the exhaust using a little bit of black paint and I'm gonna take a dry brush and stipple it. Creating this ashy and worn out look just really drives everything home. I know I've probably mentioned this more than a few times by the end of this recording, but this is super fun, especially if you're new to the hobby. It's really satisfying, it's relatively easy, and it can be applied to any kind of metallics that you're working with. But hey, I think I've covered just about everything I can as far as the lore portion of the Althean as well as a little bit of hobbying, so I think I've definitely been flapping my beak enough for one video. If you liked what you saw, leave a like, comment, and subscribe, share it with a friend, and remember to mishmash kitbash and paint some fantastic miniatures. And you're gonna. I promise. See ya.